30, Wayne Higby and Anne Currier will be leading a gallery walk through of the exhibition of bronze sculptures by Ruben Nakian. That's at the Ceramic Art Museum. And tomorrow at 12.20, the regular environmental studies talk in the Science Centre will be given by Stephen Jacobi, the retired bi biology professor from Alfred State College. The topic is phenology, sun, earth, life, and the seasons. And at the same time, there's a Women and Gender Studies Roundtable in Herrick. It's a student-led discussion. The topic is where we are discussing anti-transgender vitriol in the United States. So it's all happening over the next couple of days. The next week's Burger and Forum will be given by Julia langdal Situ, And fittingly, before Halloween, the topic is spooky psychology, the real psychological science behind ghosts, ESP, out-of-body experiences, and other psychological, parapsychological phenomena. Today, we are delighted to have as our presenter, Jean Bernstein. Jean is a director at Northville Industries and a New York-based company. And he's served on Alfred University's Board of Trustees for many years. The topic is one that been, he's been actively involved with for a long time, the debate over gun control. But before hearing what we have to say, I'd like to present him with a small gift on behalf of the Division of Human Studies to thank him for coming here to present and for all he's done for the university. So, Jean. Thank you. And, um, I'll now hand it over to, to you. Okay. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you, I think, for the opportunity to be here. Um, I haven't, I, I did for a while have an academic background and spoke in conferences and things, but I haven't done that in 41 years, so I maybe I have a few cobwebs. Um, and uh, as Emmer said, I was a I'm, a, I'm an Alfred grad. I was here from 65 to 69. I was an English major. Uh, and I want to repeat that name, Brady United to End gun violence. So emphasize that neither Brady nor any of the other major gun violence prevention groups want to take away the right to own a gun or a rifle, with a few exceptions backed by a majority of Americans. And I'll come back to that later. The talk will offer a brief look at the original meaning of the Second Amendment and how it's been interpreted through history including with where things are now with gun violence in America and why we need common sense restrictions on guns as we have had throughout history and as we have on First Amendment free speech rights. Let's start by looking at the language of the Second Amendment. And I'm quoting, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. There's a tremendous amount of debate about what exactly <laughs> those words mean, with litigation reaching the Supreme Court multiple times. But, writes Michael Waldman, in a wonderfully researched book entitled The Second Amendment, a biography, from which I have drawn much of my historical information, quote, for over 218 years, judges overwhelmingly concluded that the amendment authorized the states to form militias, what we now call the National Guard. Then in 2008, the US Supreme Court upended two centuries of precedent. In the case of District of Columbia versus Heller, an opinion written by Antonin Scalia declared that the constitution confers a right to own a gun for self-defense in the home. During the 218 years that Waldman referred to, there were numerous laws that controlled guns, despite disagreement over whether the right to bear arms was a collective one, such as serving in the militia, 
or an individual one, such as for self-defense in the home. Waldman cites many examples, but let this one suffice because notably it was decided in what was considered to be a frontier state, not an urban one. Over time, he writes, the quote, Arkansas doctrine limiting the constitutional right to the militia became the standard interpretation. It was pungently expressed in another frontier state, Tennessee, where a law prohibiting the carrying of a quote, Bowie knife or an Arkansas toothpick, there were weapons that were easily concealed. A man convicted of brandishing a knife claimed a violation of his right to bear arms. But in an 1840 ruling, the state's highest court explained that the provision was modeled on English Bill of Rights and the Second Amendment. In the decision, they wrote, the object then for which the right of keeping and bearing arms is secured is the defense of the public. A key was the phrase bear arms, which was understood by our founding fathers to have a military meaning as per the many examples during the formation of our nation that are cited in Waldman's book. He goes back and looks at various things that were written in the 1770s, the 1780s, at the time the Constitution and the um, Bill of Rights was being done and looked at how bare arms was being used. The, the opinion goes on to say, and I quote, a man in the pursuit of deer, elk, and buffaloes might carry his rifle every day for 40 years and yet it would never be said of him that he had borne arms. Much less could it be said that a private citizen bears arms because he has a dirk or a pistol concealed under his clothes or a spear and a cane. Disagreements about the rights to bear arms continued into the 20th century, but laws were still enacted, many of them after World War I, as hundreds of thousands of men returned from battle having learned to how to use firearms, and in particular, military assault weapons. Those of us of a certain age will remember the many mobster movies of the 30s and the 40s, and other movies of that era, such as The Godfather and its sequels, which featured machine guns. They grew out of a desire of gun manufacturers to sell guns to the public once they were no longer in demand, World War I was over. Still laws were passed, among them, the National Firearms Act of 1934, the Federal Fire Act, Firearms Act of 1938, the Omnibus Crime Control and Safe Streets Act of 1968, the Gun Control Act of 1968, both born out of the violence in the mid to late 60s. There was also the Firearm Owners Protection Act of 1986, which prohibited the sale to civilians of automatic firearms. The Gun-Free School Zones Act of 1990, the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act of 1993, and the Federal Assault Weapons Ban of 1994, which sunset 10 years later in 2004 because it wouldn't be renewed by Republicans in Congress. So there was plenty of precedent to have gun restriction laws throughout our history. Even the National Rifle Association, created in 1871, to remedy the lack of skills that a military people realized from soldiers who had, sworn, who had served in the Civil War and didn't know how to shoot well, didn't know how to take care of their weapons, even in the, the National Rifle Association was backed, um, in the backed legislation in 1931, limit concealed weapons to prevent possession by criminals, the mentally ill and children, to require all dealers to be licensed and to require background checks before delivery of weapons. Resistance to such laws began in the late 1960s when a group of National Rifle Association members gained control of the organization. Despite the fact that it had been established to train, I quote now, to train American men to shoot accurately and safely, 
It sponsored tournaments. It pushed for rifle competition in things like the Olympics. The NRA was taken over by a group that was much more politically motivated. Despite the fact that when the NRA moved to a new building in 1958, metal letters out on front explain that the NRA was there for firearm safety, education, marksmanship training, and shooting for recreation. And in 1968, a decade after that move, NRA President Harold Glassen clarified the organization's position on the Second Amendment. Quote, does it, it being the right to bear arms, mean that every individual has a right to carry a gun at all times, concealed or openly? Obviously not. With the violence of the 1960s bleeding into the 1970s, the NRA's traditional interests were discarded. And at the 1977 annual meeting, of, often referred to as the revolt at Cincinnati, new leadership took over, a leadership that was, in Waldman's words, dramatic, dogmatic, and overly ideological. From there on, the relative consensus about the need to limit guns devolved into a socioeconomic and political battle. The lines were drawn between rural and urban, Republican and Democrat, blue collar and white collar, et cetera, et cetera. In 1980, for the first time in its history, the NRA endorsed a presidential candidate, Ronald Reagan, an exemplar of Western culture and opposition to government regulations. Ironically, Reagan was the victim of an assassination attempt, as were two other people in his entourage, including his press secretary, Jim Brady. After that, Reagan pushed for what became the Brady Handgun Violence Prevention Act, passed in 1993 under President Clinton, which amended the Gun Control Act of 1968. It mandated federal background checks and imposed a five-day waiting period on purchases, but it expired in 2004. And as a result, approximately 20% of the guns sold today have no background check such as those sold at flea markets, person to person among family members, online, or even more ominously, ghost guns. Then of course, there was the 2008 District of Columbia versus Heller case in the Supreme Court, which as mentioned, ruled that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to keep and bear arms for self-defense in the home and not just for service in the militia or National Guard. This decision was incredible in two ways. First, conservatives on the court typically put a heavy weight on precedent, what is called in legal terms stare decisis, a Latin term meaning, quote, to stand by things decided. Yet here they went against over 200 years of precedent. To give you an idea of how rare this is, since its creation, the Supreme Court has rendered over 25,500 decisions and only 146 or less than one half of 1% have been overturned. Second and often overlooked, in that opinion, Scalia added that quote, like most rights, the right secured by the second amendment is not unlimited. It is not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever in any manner whatsoever and for whatever reason. In addition to traditionally championing star right decisis or precedents, Scalia and more recently justices like Thomas and Alito have stood firm as originalists, defined by the legal scholar Steve Calabrese of the very conservative Heritage Foundation as, quote, those who believe that the constitutional text ought to be given the original public meaning that it would have had at the time it became law. But there's not a single syllable in the Second Amendment that refers to bearing arms in the home for self-defense. Moreover, if we wanna be originalists about the Second Amendment, the arms that could be born are pistols and muskets, not AK-47s and AR-15s. 
incredible to me also as a PhD in English literature who taught freshman composition for 10 years and had eight scholarly articles published at journals hosted by Boston University, Johns Hopkins, University of Chicago, among others, is the total misreading of the grammar in the Second Amendment. True. It reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That sentence has a conditional clause. It's very different from saying the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's an absolute statement. The other one's conditioned on having a militia and defending the state. That difference in and of itself should nullify any argument that individuals have an absolute right to bear arms for whatever reason. The Supreme Court upheld this interpretation for over two centuries, as I mentioned before. For example, in 1939, the case of the United States versus Miller, it opined that, quote, the obvious purpose of the Second Amendment was to render possible the effectiveness of militias. And so it should be interpreted and applied with that end in view. Yet the Supreme Court overturned this 200 year precedent, as well as the definition of bare arms, which had nothing to do with personal use, while overlooking the omission of any reference to personal self-defense in the original words. <clears throat> as with so many contemporary problems, this issue is metastasized along political lines state rights versus federal rights, government regulations at any level versus individual rights, and others that have reared their heads like abortion, COVID restrictions, etc. An example of the state versus federal issue is the 2010 decision in McDonald versus Chicago, protecting against states as opposed to the federal government infringing on the right to possess a handgun for self-defense. And the more recent New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin struck down state law, but also acknowledged that the state could pass some restrictive laws, such as a prohibition on, quote, dangerous and unusual weapons. But what is dangerous and unusual? In the 2017 massacre at the Mandalay Bay Hotel in Las Vegas, hotel shooter Stephen Paddock used 18 AR-15 type rifles and eight 308 caliber AR-10 type rifles to kill 60 people and wound 413. Do those military assault weapons qualify as dangerous and unusual? Are they necessary for self-defense in the home or hunting? Robert Spitzer, a professor not far from here at SUNY Cortland specializes in gun issues, explained this transition very well. Gun culture, he wrote, brings together the hunting sporting tradition with the militia frontier tradition. But in modern times, the hunting element has been eclipsed by a heavily politicized notion that gun gathering is an expression of freedom, individuality, hostility to government and personal self-protection. Of the Mandalay slaughter, Bill O'Reilly said on TV, massacres are the price of freedom. So where does this leave us? Here are some facts about guns in America. Let me see if I can do this. Um, Age-adjusted firearm homicide rates in the US are 22 times greater than in the European Union and 23 times greater than in Australia. Fact two, gun violence accounts for over 7% of the deaths in the US among children under 20 and is the leading cause of death of children under 20 in America. More than car accidents, more than drowning, more than anything else, guns kill more children than any other thing. America has more guns than it has people. The rate of gun deaths per 100,000 far exceeds other countries. Is an, um... Well, I'm not sure what's... 
is can you yeah thanks Okay, sorry, thank you. This is another graphic way of showing that the United States way up on the far right, way ahead of any of these other uh, wealthy, wealthy type countries. Um, third fact, mass shootings in the US are on the rise. We're up to 476 as of the 28th of August. I can guarantee you there's probably another 50 since then. And Americans are increasingly dissatisfied with the, govern the, gov the laws we have now. You see it jumped up to 66, it comes down a little bit to 57, but overall it's trending up from 47% in, in 2015. So why isn't enough being done on a national level? Despite passage in 2022 of the first major gun safety law in nearly 30 years, well, in addition to the political and geographic factors mentioned before, much opposition to common sense gun laws is predicated on a lie promulgated by groups like the NRA, which as mentioned previously, underwent a dramatic change from sponsoring gun safety and marksmanship and competition to politi politicizing gun rights. The lie that the gun violence prevention uh, groups I'm sorry, the lie is that the gun violence prevention groups want to take away your guns. About this lie, former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Warren Berger, appointed by the Republican Richard Nixon, opined, this has been the subject of one of the greatest pieces of fraud, and I repeat the word fraud on the American public by a special interest group I have ever seen in my lifetime. Why one of the greatest frauds? Because as I said, none of the leading gun violence prevention groups want to take away a citizen's right to own a gun or a rifle. There's evidence of that. Here are some of the mission statements. Giffords is an organization dedicated to saving lives from gun violence, led by former Congresswoman Gabriel Giffords. We inspire the courage of people all walks of life to make America safe. Nothing about taking away guns from people. Sandy Hook Promise. Sandy Hook, you'll remember, is the village in Connecticut where 21 children were massacred and five adults. Sandy Hook Promise envisions a future where children are free from shootings and acts of violence in their schools, homes, and communities. Nothing about taking away the right to have a gun. Every Town, the biggest organization of all because it's funded by Bloomberg, talks about all these things. They're fighting for the changes that will save lives. Not a word about taking away people's rights. But it hasn't stopped groups like the NRA or even the Supreme Court from distorting the issue. The second distortion about common sense gun control is what they call the slippery, slippery slope argument that once you start banning, say, military assault weapons, it will then lead to the banning of guns and rifles. But during the 10 years that the Brady Bill ban on such weapons was in effect, no federal or state authorities went knocking on doors and confiscated <laughs> weapons. And I'm sure there's probably a few of you in here who are hunters and have weapons, and no one came and took your weapons away when that bill was in force. Current owners at the time were grandfathered, and while future sales were eliminated until they weren't, and are now the weapon of choice for mass murderers. A third argument is that the problem is a mental health issue. And it's true that most mass, mass, mass killers are young men with very problematic emotional and psychological issues. But all countries in the Western world have people with such mental <laughs> issues. Their kids see as many violent shows, movies, and videos as ours. But their kids don't have access to guns in the way, the, the way kids in the U.S. do. A fourth argument is that even if we pass common sense gun restrictions, it won't end gun deaths. This is true. And the law mandating seatbelts didn't prevent deaths in car accidents, but it dramatically reduced them. Likewise, warnings about cigarette smoking reduced lung cancer deaths. 
didn't eliminate them, but it reduced them dramatically. If we accept laws requiring safety belts and infant seats, why not laws requiring background checks and safe storage in homes? The argument that having a gun or a rifle at home makes you safer is specious as well. I have been unable to find statistics on this, but I do know that I read far more about children accidentally shooting a sibling or a parent or a guest than I do about an intruder. Unless, of course, the horrible recent incidents where people were shot by either driving up the wrong driveway or knocking on the wrong door. So what does Brady want? Three things. Universal background checks, because 20% of the guns sold in America, as I mentioned, have no background check, which means any criminal, terrorist, or psychotic can get their hands on one. Not only do gun violence prevention groups want this, but so do an overwhelming majority of Americans, including members of rifle groups and gun groups. The second thing is a ban on military assault weapons, which by definition are designed to kill as many people as possible as quickly as possible. What this has to do with self-defense at home or hunting escapes me. The third thing gun violence prevention groups want is red flag laws, which enable law enforcement to remove a weapon from a person deemed by a judge to be a risk to him or herself or others. You know, like the many mass killers who post on social media, how they plan to kill other students or teachers or ex-lovers or blacks or Jews or whatever. I read recently that the, um, the killer in Las Vegas, one of his friends had been pleading with him for six months because he was getting so upset, so whatever, and this and that. And he said, don't, this friend was writing, don't harm anyone, don't do anything. If there had been a red flag law, if he had gone to law enforcement, they would have been able to get a judge to give them permission to take away this guy's weapons. These are all common sense gun violence prevention actions that in no way deny law-abiding citizens the ability to purchase guns or rifles. And I'll show you finally, um, here's statistics about what the majority of Americans feel about different types of federal law. The federal law requiring background checks, 85%. The federal law that bans those convicted of domestic violence, 83%, making 21. These are all things, they're not going to take away the right of a, a, a normal person, no problems, no legal problems, no emotional, psychological problems to have a gun. Even the ban on AR-15s, you've got almost 60%. So um, the American public seems to want it. Somehow it doesn't get done like many other things that don't get done in Congress. Uh, it's pretty simple. We do not in the gun violence prevention area wanna take away people's rights to have guns. We want to reduce gun violence. Thank you. Uh, plenty of time questions. Could I ask you to use the microphone please for the benefit of people on Zoom? Uh, let me just mention, this is a fabulous book. It's not long. It's called The Second Amendment, A Biography. It, it, it treats the Second Amendment like a baby when it was born in 1770s and 80s. Looks at the language, bare arms, militias, traces the history all the way up. It's, not a, it's, a, it's an easy read, and it's very, very informative. There's also a new book. I forget the name. It was just reviewed in the uh, New York Times Book Review about the... Uh, AR-15, what's called American's gun or something like that, and the history of the development of assault weapons and automatic weapons in the United States, how it evolved out of efforts to try to make our soldiers more efficient. When they didn't need it for soldiers, they started selling it to the public. Uh, also a very good book, highly recommend. I would like to comment on your your graph showing the number of deaths in various countries. And this kind of backs up what you're saying, that you can, you, can reg you can regulate guns. You don't have to take them away. Countries have one-tenth of our death rates, and yet they have guns. I know people in Norway and, and Switzerland oh, and yeah. Canada. They have lots of guns, but they have reasonable laws behind them. And, and 
And so just backing up what you're saying. Yeah, I just saw an article, uh, uh, a piece that um, it's harder to get a permit to own a dog in Tennessee than to get a weapon. You have to fill out more forms and whatever. And and those charts were, by the way, uh, uh, were you know on the per one hundred thousand people, so they were adjusted per capita. It wasn't just that we had so many more; it was per per hundred thousand people. Gene, I think uh, Australia had a uh, buyback plan, yes. and it was very successful. Uh, given the amount of guns that are out in our culture, uh, where does that stand? Uh, I don't know if you have any information for us on that. I've always been curious why that couldn't get going. Well, I don't know, but I don't, I don't know any, like none of these groups want to buy back guns or do away with guns. You know, I mean, it's been done on, on a very localized level. Villages and towns have done it, cities have done it, uh, but there's a right in the second amendment to have some arms, you know, whether it's an individual right or, or, or a military right, but uh, none of the groups want to do away with the Second Amendment. Although one of the former Supreme Court justices, I don't remember which one, said at one point if he could change anything in the Constitution, he would do away with the Second Amendment. <laughs> you said that 20% uh, of guns purchased um, had no background check, no no limitation. Do you have specifics on where the what those exceptions are and why? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. What do you mean that's exceptions? You can go to a flea market. Anyone can go to a flea market and buy a gun, for example. Right. So it's so it's the it's the gun shows, gun the shows, other places. Uh, where... Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, the, the, there are there are hundreds and hundreds of federally licensed gun dealers. They register with the federal government. They are obligated to do a background check. 98% of them do. They, they found that like something like, I'm just rounding off, something like 60% of the weapons used in homicides and whatever are sold by 2% of the dealers. And so there's an effort to try to identify those. Brady has done that, that through a Freedom of Information Act, we did it in New Jersey. And we were able to match up where guns were sold and then where they were used in crimes. And it's a very complicated issue. Um, there are about 42,000 gun deaths in America every year. Roughly half of them are suicides. A very high percentage of them are from military and police. Uh, one of the things Brady has is a program modeled using the terminology of the military and family. They have friendly fire in the military. Uh, an American accidentally shoots another American soldier. We have a program we're running in Missouri called End Family Fire. And it's an effort to work with gun owners, make sure your gun is locked up, make sure it's in a safe place. There are companies who are even exploring whether they could offer in some states a tax break to uh, stores that sell weapons if a person buys a safe to put the gun in and store it. There's a lot of battles going on. Um, a big one was won a couple of years ago. Remington lost a $73 million lawsuit. Remington was the company that uh, sold the weapons that were used in Sandy Hook. Uh, there is something called PLACA, which protects legal something so that gun, gun dealers and stores couldn't be sued. But they found a sort of a way around it by attacking the way the company was advertising. And they had things like, you know, show your manhood and all these commercials and ads online that these 16 year olds would watch and get all hyped up. And a jury upheld that that was a, a major cause of why this was done. And Remington was fined $73 million. There's other things like efforts to uh, raise insurance for people who have automatic weapons and things like that. It's a, it's a multifaceted kind of effort to try to reduce gun violence. Gene, I have a question. Um, one would expect that uh, one group that would be very much in favor of gun control would be the police. Uh, is that true? And perhaps uh, it seems to me that the police aren't at the forefront of um, advocating gun control. Why is that? Uh, I think in general they are in favor of this, um, especially assault weapons. I mean, most of the mass killings are assault weapons based. But a lot of them are, are, are political 
and you know, the, like I'm on a board of a police foundation on Long Island. The the head of the commission of the police is appointed by the county executive. It's a Republican or a Democrat, and so politics gets involved a little bit. They have to say we're upholding the law. We're not taking a side one way or the other. I promise this will be a friendly question. <laughs> They're all friendly. The, uh, I know that. The assault weapons issue is one that is such serious concern given the court cases that you alluded to and the interpretations that recently the Supreme Court has given, both in terms of the philosophy interpretation of the Constitution. Uh, so notwithstanding the challenge of getting a federal ban into legislation, I do wonder and wonder what you think of what the prospects would be for the legal challenge to an assault weapons ban today compared to well, what what's happening years ago. today with weapons is similar to what's happening in the abortion area. And um, there's, you know, at the federal level, Roe versus Wade up, overturned another precedent. That one was only 30 years or so, 40 years, as opposed to 218 years with guns. But individual states are passing laws. Some are prohibiting any kind of abortion. And again, there's a battle. So the NRA has it out there in gun owners' minds that we want to take away their guns. Look at the mission statements, whatever. Nothing talks about taking away guns unless on a red flag law. You're some guy that's posted stuff. I'm going to go, you know, kill my teacher. I'm going to go shoot my wife that I'm divorced from, whatever. So th those are happening state by state. But NRA has got that in, in gun owners' minds. And, and the same thing, like in the abortion debate, anti-abortion people say that people on the other side are pro-abortion. They're not necessarily pro-abortion. They're pro-choice. My wife and I are pro-choice. We are not in favor of abortions. We hope women never have abortions, but we don't think it's our position to tell them. So we're not pro-abortion, we're pro-choice. But the language is always, they're pro-abortion. So it's the same kind of thing that's happening. In each state, the blue states are passing stricter laws on guns. Some of them get overturned, some of them they rewrite. You know, concealed carry is a big issue. There is a statistic I didn't show, but the, definitely the states with the most lax laws about gun control have the most gun deaths, as you would expect. The more guns that are out there, the more gun deaths there are going to be. The more cars are on the highway, the more car accidents there are going to be. It's, it's pretty common sense. But it's doing state by state, and it's very red versus blue, like abortion. I, I, a couple of questions. Uh, one is one of the uh, tactics that the anti-gun lobby has utilized, or not so much utilized, but has at least talked not about. Not anti-gun, don't say that. Okay, not anti-gun, but, uh, you know, the gun control, whatever. Gun uh, violence prevention. Gun violence prevention is suing manufacturers of firearms. Can you address that? Well, they're, they're, I, I, you can't sue them like you could sue, say, you know, a car company because they had a defective part, but they are suing them for advertising. There was a big article this week also, uh, one of the companies that I think owns the AR-15 has been paying placement money to have their rifles used in some of the online videos that kids play with. You know, the way in movies, you know, Mercedes will pay to have a car in there or a liquor company will pay to have their drink being used in the mirror to try to influence. So we're working, for example, with a lot of Hollywood producers for movies and TVs to try to change the culture. What does that mean? Well, there's a zillion police shows on TV. Typically, the policeman comes home from a top, he goes to the refrigerator, you know, he gets a beer, whatever. We're trying to get him to do things like the policeman comes home, he takes out his gun, he puts it in the safe, and then he goes and gets a beer. And, and trying to sort of, it's, it's like trying to move, you know, a tanker in the ocean. It's a very slow thing, but trying to change the cultural attitude towards weapons and guns to, to try to get people to think about being safe. And then I got a kind of a follow-up question, which is not directly related, but it has to do with the fact that right now, to the extent that there is anti-gun violence legislation, it tends to be on the state level. But there are neighboring states, of course, that might not have this kind of thing. And yeah. so 
someone from California where there are restrictions can you know drive across uh, to Nevada and uh, or Idaho and, and and get as many firearms I suppose uh, as one wants. Uh, can you is there any hope for this kind of thing for this kind of you know serious anti-gun violent uh, uh, legislation uh, without a federal mandate? I don't think so because you know local legislatures in each state are going to reflect whatever their voters want. Uh, this is a big issue. I mean, Chicago is a high, high rate of gun violence, but they've tracked those guns. Most of them come from Indiana because Indiana has very lax rules about it. And, you know, Chicago's right by the border of Indiana. Um, but it, it's going to be a state by state kind of thing. I mean, if Obama couldn't get something through after Sandy Hook, I don't know what hope there is. So we keep fighting in these other ways. It's kind of, I, I kind of use the analogy of football. Instead of trying to ram it straight through the line or through Congress, we go around the end and try these different things, lawsuits, end family fire, oil information about which dealers are selling, uh, selling illegally. We all remember when we were 17 or 18 year olds and wanted to get beer, we couldn't and we got someone to go in and buy it for us. There are a lot of people do that now. They, if they went in and got a background check, they wouldn't be permitted to do it. So they have a straw purchaser go in, someone, a friend, a relative, and go in and buy them the weapon. And it, it, ultimately, that person who used the weapon gets caught, and they're able to go back and um, penalize the dealer in the store. In some cases, even if there's a recurring pattern, you can take away their license and shut them down. Any further questions? Jean, could you repeat the question? Yeah, she asked if I did I talk about guns in schools? No, um, not particularly, but uh, you know, I think it's a horror that our kids are, you know, five year olds are learning how to hide under desks and what they have to do to lock doors. And I mean, it's unbelievable. And, um, you know, my wife and I go to Europe a lot. And one of the things we, we always hear wherever we are, we were in Ireland, we were in Amsterdam, we were you know, like, what's with the guns in America and all the gun violence? You know? um, and, you know, they don't have a Second Amendment that talks about the right to bear arms, even though it's distorted because it's a military right. But, but um, you know, school districts do their own training. There's a lot of arguments about whether teachers should be having armaments or not, or having guns. And we know three. We have three relatives who are teachers, and like, I don't want to be holding a gun. I don't know. I mean, half the time the wrong person gets shot. You don't know who it is. And what chance do you have with a pistol that some 17-year-old maniac with a vest on and an AK-47 is blasting his way through the school? Has um, has uh, Americans' understanding about other people with mental health problems has that evolved in any way since all of these shootings? It well, seems like that's the root of a lot of this. Well, you have the mental health problems, the emotional issues. You, I think a lot of you know that we see that with students here at the university, and it's not just Alfred; it's all around. But the access is part of the problem. Um, the same day that Sandy Hook happened in a remote town in China, a man went into school and started the same kind of attack on kids. The exact same day, but he had a knife. None of them died. He didn't have an assault weapon. And they were able to, you know, stop him. And he couldn't, a knife isn't nearly as, you know, uh, dangerous as an assault weapon. The, the, the bill that was passed last year does have an allocation of money to strengthen mental health counseling and stuff like that, but it, it'll probably still ultimate being a state and local issue to deal with. Yeah, um, over here. Oh, um, 
there's been a lot recently with the courts, such as in the case of Roe v. Wade, actually kind of throwing out and overruling previous precedents. Do you think that's a concern here? Because there have been a lot of precedents of gun control laws, plus with the Second Amendment, you know, it's actually conditional on being a military, right? Do you think, I guess, that those precedents are going to be ignored and thrown out the same way others have been? It's, it's hard to say. Um... I think you know people have very low confidence in in the court system right now. I think a lot of it has to do with this change, the politicization of the court, the effort by Roberts and others to make it not seem that way. Um, I don't know what other cases are going to come up, but obviously they don't have any compunctions about breaking precedents. You know, the Roe versus Wade was about a forty year precedent, but this other one was two hundred and eighteen years. And language that says conditionally it's for militias. So, you know, and then an argument they make, well, let's go back to the original meaning. Well, there was nothing in the original words about personal use. So, I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, have a musket. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's almost one o'clock. So, people, some people okay. have to go to class. Let's thank Gene again for the talk. Okay. Thank you.